Welcome to episode 75 of the GT on 5G. It's the latest insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, joining you from Denver International Airport this week. And joining me again is uh, fellow analyst Anshul Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. Uh, Vodafone uh, recently announced an expansion of their fiber partnerships. Um, they've been partnered with uh, BT OpenReach for, for a while, but they recently announced uh, an announcement with City Fiber. And what uh, Vodafone claims this will do will give them an 8 million home coverage footprint in a dozen major cities in the UK. And they're boasting that this will be the largest than any other provider. BBC actually contacted me this week. There may be an article that they're posting uh, at any moment and wanted me to weigh in on this. And I, I think it's quite compelling from the perspective of um, the fact that Vodafone has also been investing obviously quite heavily in 5G. And certainly if they augment this fiber footprint with fixed wireless access services for those parts of the UK, which there are quite a few that are underserved by fiber, this could really position them well in the mobile broadband market. What are your thoughts, buddy? Well, you know, Vodafone doesn't necessarily have the um, infrastructure advantage that BT does. Um, mm -hmm. Because BT is, a, you know, a traditional telecom and has decades of building their own, their, you know, their own fiber networks um, and, and having, you know, a much larger footprint, especially when they acquired EE. So um, mm -hmm. I think this is a good thing for Vodafone because, you know, they need to um, broaden their network's capabilities. And to your point, um, there's a there's also a chance that they, they could use some of this fiber to help build out their 5G network, mm -hmm. um, you know, build once, serve twice, and possibly mm -hmm. even fix wireless, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a net positive. I'm I'm definitely a proponent of fiber. Um, I used to have fiber at home and I dearly miss it and I will very soon have it once again. So um, I just think fiber is the way forward and we're clearly seeing other other operators going down the same path, realizing that just fiber is the future, whether whether people like it or not. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I like the fact that uh, Vodafone has been very focused on discrete service delivery. And you know they're looking beyond just the traditional, you know, their traditional 5G deployment. So this will be interesting to keep tabs on. But let's move to your first topic this week. And uh, Root Metrics has published another report and uh, they provide some insight on T-Mobile, right? Yeah, so they, they're they doing the three big carriers, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the thing is, is that we've got Root Metrics, we've got Open Signal, we've got Ookla, and generally they have different test methodologies because they have different ways of gathering data. Um, and, and in many cases, you know, they have different weighting systems. So it's always really good to kind of um, wait and see what all the three big speed testing uh, companies say about networks before really making um, assumptions of what the, the state of 5G is amongst American carriers. Mm -hmm. um, but basically this root metrics, you know, um, this root metrics study came out and basically said that T-Mobile um, absolutely um, walped the competition on speed. Mm -hmm. um, and has significantly improved its reliability um, and already leads in coverage and availability. Um, so, you know, they were saying that it, it's, uh, there was like a, a, a data, they, they have like this whole PDF where they go through and talk through the 60 recently tested cities. Mm -hmm. And they're basically saying that T-Mobile is just momentum and just keeps moving forward. And that they're the only carrier to exceed 100 or 200 megabits. Mm -hmm. um, in their testing, and uh, they, they they're basically saying that for the foreseeable future, um, they expect T-Mobile to continue this momentum, uh, which is exactly in line what you and I have been saying since the beginning of this year. Um, mm -hmm. That you know T-Mobile's midband rollout is fast, um, it's aggressive, and mm -hmm. it's significantly improving the company's speeds. Um, compared to where they were when they were just using low band for 5G. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's not only narrowed the gap, it has blown through the gap and blown past the gap. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what will happen once T-Mobile, you know, gets their, um, their mid-band coverage close to where their low band is, mm -hmm. because that will be, um, you know, the, the critical point of critical mass uh, for, for their mid-band network. I didn't dig into it and I plan to, but from your perspective, does standalone factor into this as well when you look at those 60 major metros? I don't think so. Um, okay. My understanding is that currently T-Mobile's low band network is standalone, but its mid band network is not quite okay. yet. Um, so I think that standalone will be the next phase once I think T-Mobile sees that, you know, they've got enough um, you know, critical mass on coverage, which is why I think that Verizon and AT&T are holding back on their deployments of standalone, mm -hmm. um, because I think they want to flip that on once they've got enough mid-band coverage to justify it. That makes sense. Well, let me move to my second topic this week. I'm actually going to double down on Open RAN, and I'll also mention, um, if you follow my Twitter feed, I'll be hosting a panel on Open RAN next week with the E5G event that's on Tuesday. But let me start with my first of two up and ran topics. This week, Germany announced a $350 million or 300 euro fund they're gonna to dedicate towards open RAN projects. And so my question is, is it enough to move the needle? And the details here, it's, the, it's Germany's Federal Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure. That's quite a mouthful. And what they're stating Try is- Try saying that, it in German. Exactly. I won't even try. But what they're, what they're stating is that this is really focused on manufacture, the manufacturing industry. And that's no surprise. Right. Some of the German automobile manufacturers are the first to be deploying cellular private networking uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the manufacture of, of automobiles. And so I really view this as Germany's opportunity to continue to extend their momentum. Germany, if you don't follow Germany, uh, and I know you're very familiar with the German market, they're very tech savvy. They tend to be very early adopters. So I'm not surprised to see this. So it's interesting that investment's going to be broken down into a number of different areas. One, a test lab. Uh, two, test bed city rollouts in two cities that I probably can't even pronounce. Not Neuenberg, but Neuen Brandenburg and Plauen. And then... <laughs> And then there's some um, individual research projects that are going to be earmarked as well. So I, I really like the fact that they've broken this down and they're, they're looking at sort of different, you know, uh, factors and that they're focused on manufacturing, which is certainly one of Germany's strengths. So wondering if you have any input here. I would say that, you know, because Open RAN is more of a greenfield deployment, um, mm -hmm. at least nowadays, right? That's what we're looking at it for. Um, that's definitely more of an enterprise play and it allows for commodity hardware and um, you know, custom tailored solutions through software. And truly Germany is you know, the manufacturing hub of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they make planes, trains, and automobiles mm -hmm. um, as well. As Love that movie, of, by the way, it's almost around the corner here <laughs> with Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, but they also, you know, they make tons of other precise equipment um, that could absolutely benefit from having faster internet connectivity between equipment, uh, engineers. Um, you know, th there's no limit to what having more bandwidth can do when you're in an industrial application. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's absolutely a rational thing for Germany to be trying to incentivize this to roll through faster um, and to do it at a lower cost, right? Because there's so many different types of factories and so many different types of industries in Germany that could benefit sure. from it. That, you know, it's, it's inevitable, I think, but I think they're just trying to speed up the inevitable. Absolutely, continue that momentum, the wind beneath their wings. Let's move to your second topic this week. And you reported on this last week about the pause on C-band rollouts due to some FAA, not FCC concerns, and you wanna provide an update. Yeah, so basically what's happening is the aviation industry is um, pushing for more delays beyond the one month delay that we uh, recently talked about last week. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like they want more uh, testing to be done 
And I have a feeling that this is most likely a push to get funding to get these replacements done. Um, you know, the, the one thing that really um, kind of makes this whole argument fall flat on its face is that the airline industry knew about this well before this auction happened. They right. had a study in place over a year ago and the data they collected is, happened over a year and a half ago. Um, they didn't use commercial networks to test this or commercial equipment, they simulated it. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot that needs to be figured out, but from the conversations that I've had with people, it doesn't sound like there was much communication between the aviation industry, um, the FAA and the carriers. Um, and it seems like um, the airline industry is trying to um, make sure that they get their way. And at this point, it, you know, the FAA hasn't made any uh, clear commitments one way or the other, um, but it just uh, doesn't, based on my reading of the 200 page document that they are basing their, their, their request for delay, it doesn't really seem like the existing bands that are being released this year will even really be part of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, it only seems like the higher bands are the ones that, that could potentially create problems. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, just replacing the, the, um, the filters on these airplanes would solve the problem. That's a cost issue. Um, and we'll see what happens. But, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and there's a lot of people who don't really understand what spurious emissions are um, mm -hmm. and how they can affect, you know, an airplane's ability to measure its altitude while it's landing, which ultimately is the main issue here. Because sure. at altitude, this is not an issue. It's only really a problem closer to the ground near the airport. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll see what happens, but um, I think this is a very unfortunate situation and it doesn't really help Verizon or AT&T who should be, you know, rolling the spectrum out within the next 30 days. And now they're pushing it back to next year by a month. So um, yeah. we'll see what happens, but it's, it's just, it doesn't really feel um, like it's necessarily something that um, feels extremely justified and is very clear in its danger. You know what it feels like to me? It feels like sort of those Facebook hearings where, you know, Zuckerberg was being interviewed and all, you know, the, it, it kind of blew me away, the lack of technical acumen that a lot of our elected leaders have. Do you think that this is part of it as well, that this is a lack of understanding and education? I think there's a lack of, um, I think it's not a lack of education as much as I think it's a lack of communication. Okay. Um, because the, the, the group who was in, put in charge of doing this testing and writing up this report is an aviation group. Um, okay. you know, they, didn't, they didn't even try to ask for the carriers or any of the carrier groups to participate. Input. In Interesting. So I think that's a big problem because it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're creating policy based on information that I believe is incomplete and mm -hmm. does not include those stakeholders who spent up almost $90 billion for spectrum right. and have almost no say in whether or not they're able to use it, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of crazy to me. And it, the other thing is, if the government took in that $90 billion and they're also paying for clearing in addition to that, where, why can't some of that money be used to pay for this? I don't know. Exactly. Understand. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, I agree. That's my issue with it. Cause like, you know, I'm great. I'm really glad that the government's able to collect all this money for the spectrum and it's very valuable, but you know, it, why isn't, why wasn't this, why isn't, wasn't there a fund set aside to make the, the kid, the kid, the airliners solve this problem. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. I would agree. And that's great insight that you provided that the operators were not involved um, in any sort of due diligence before the FAA decided to do what they did. But this will be interesting. We're going to definitely keep our uh, eyes and ears open on it. Let me move to my third and final topic this week. It is open RAN. 
um, Orange opened uh, a RAN integration center and it happened this week. And they've invited a number of different partners uh, to participate with them. Uh, it's, in, it's near Paris. And the objective is just to ensure interoperability. And one of the big standouts for me was a partnership with Samsung Networks from a RAN perspective. And certainly, I think historically, when you look at the incumbent providers of RAN solutions, Ericsson and Nokia come to mind, not necessarily Samsung, but from my perspective, Samsung is really stepping up its game. We've talked about how their design wins with Verizon early in Verizon's 5G deployment really signaled their first step out of their core Korean and Asian market. And so from my perspective, here's another announcement that really points to the momentum that Samsung Networks is building behind its portfolio. And one of the superpowers that I think it brings to the table relative to its European competitors is how deep it is within semiconductor manufacturing, automotive, all of these different vertical industries where they have some tribal knowledge around use cases and applications. And I'm not saying that Nokia and Ericsson don't, but Samsung brings, I think, a different element to the table. And so I continue to be impressed with their momentum. I don't know if you caught this announcement, but would love to get your insight on it. I saw it, but I didn't really look into it too much, mm -hmm. um, partially because you're our resident open RAN guy, sure. um, but also because you know it's, it's another another win for Samsung, um, and yeah, I mean they've really. The thing that I'll say is, you know, Open RAN didn't really feel like it was uh, a part of what they were trying to do initially, mm -hmm. um, but it seems like Samsung has been listening to their customers and are trying to, you know, expand into areas of infrastructure where their customers need them to be, um, and I, it mm -hmm. seems like you know Samsung has created competition uh, in the market that otherwise um, may not have been there. Um, that said, you know, Huawei is still um, not present in a lot of these markets. Right. So um, it's a good thing that Samsung has, you know, picked up the baton in some of these regions and is offering solutions um, and is giving, you know, Ericsson and Nokia a run for their money. I agree. You mentioned Huawei. They've been on the sidelines with respect to Open RAN beyond their current challenges. And there was actually, I read just before we got on the call here, that the Biden administration sort of signed the death warrant with Huawei and ZTE, basically ruling out any opportunity for them to deploy in the U.S. We may save that for another podcast, but let's move to your third and final topic this week. And it's XR themed, you are our XR mixed reality VR AR expert, and you want to talk about Qualcomm, Deutsche Telekom, Docomo, and T-Mobile, right? Yeah, so I was at a uh, conference called AWE this week, uh, which is also known as Augmented World Expo, and it's kind of an XR conference. Um, and at that conference, Qualcomm announced its new Snapdragon Spaces XR platform, which is basically a way to enable uh, smartphone developers to take their existing AR apps and to add, or their existing apps and to add AR features to them and to enable them to also allow for AR headsets to be connected to the phone and use that capability. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, you know, it's a change of strategy for Qualcomm. Uh, you know, they're a very big player in the 5G space. So naturally they've also partnered with a bunch of um, content developers uh, to create content using this new platform, as well as partnerships with operators from around the world, including Deutsche Telekom, NTT Docomo, and T-Mobile, mm -hmm. to essentially make this platform the default for their XR services um, and their XR programs, so that when a developer wants to roll something out, they start with you know the Spaces platform uh, as their default. That said, Spaces is compatible only with Qualcomm Snapdragon devices. So mm -hmm. iOS is out of the question, um, and and anything based on um, let's say MediaTek or Samsung also won't work. But in the U.S., that's less of a concern since most Android phones run on Snapdragon in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That said, the new uh, Pixel Six won't, won't run on this either. So there are some users who will not be able to take advantage of this 
new XR plot, this new XR platform that enables AR applications both on the phone and in the headset. Um, but it's it's just good to see that um, they've managed to come to market very aggressively, um, and they already have some of the biggest carriers in the world already on board to embrace this with whatever applications they choose to um, offer to their customers. Good stuff. Anything else you want to add there on um, the, the lines of Docomo and T-Mobile? Um, I would say that um, they're not the only ones that are involved. There's smartphone vendors like Xiaomi um, and Oppo who are also partners as well as Lenovo and Motorola. In mm -hmm. fact, the um, Motorola Think Reality A3, which is an AR headset, is the kind of like default development device that Qualcomm is recommending. Um, so that when people want to develop AR glasses applications using this uh, Snapdragon Spaces platform, they can use an already existing Lenovo headset, which I just so happen to already have on my desk. Nice. <laughs> you get all the nice toys, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it, it's it's a big deal because um, Google has been very absent in the in the space, um, and somebody has needed to take um, hold and create something that. Um, developers can rely on and has enough critical mass that allows them to make applications profitably. Um, and, and the important thing here is Qualcomm's not trying to create a new uh, game engine or a new way for development because they already have partnerships with Epic, on Unity, and Niantic. So this is kind of something that you would build on top of. You wouldn't necessarily be starting with this as the, the basis of everything that you're doing, but it's something that enables you to have hand tracking and, and a bunch of other features because Qualcomm just bought two companies to fold into this uh, mm -hmm. to make it as capable as it is. So uh, it's gonna, it's, I think it's gonna necessarily um, make some big improvements in, in the uptake of AR and 5G together. Yeah, and I, I've talked to some of the use cases there with field service and it's quite compelling. I've seen some Qualcomm demos and I'm actually looking forward. I'll be at a Qualcomm event in New York City next week, learning it may be, it may be about this subject, but likely other, yeah, you'll be there as well. And uh, maybe we can do a, a little you know, recording while we're there at the event and share that with our listeners and viewers. But hey, buddy, this has been another great podcast. Why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide us insights on a specific 5G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Whaletown Tech and I'm at Anshal Saad. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune again next week.